Well, good morning again. Before we dive into the word, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you and, um, Lord, there's two things that I know right now about everybody in here. <laughs> Number one, none of us like change, Lord. No matter what the change is, it's hard for us. And number two, all of us need to change. In some way, in some shape, in some form, there is some amount of change needed and necessary in all of our lives so that we can look, act, speak, and live more like you. So, Father, I just pray today that you would change us. Lord, change our minds. Change our hearts. Change our attitude. Change our perspective. Change us. Change me. Lord, may that be our prayer today. Change me. Amen. We are going to be in the Gospel of Matthew today. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 14. We're on a journey through a book written by a guy by the name of Michael Frost. The book is called Surprise the World. How many of you have a copy? If you're in a small group, I'm sure you have a copy. If not, I would encourage you to get a copy. Short little itty-bitty book, short little itty-bitty, really easy to understand chapters. Um, it is not too late to get one and get caught up with us. We are only in week two. You can get them on Amazon or wherever books are sold. This week we arrive in our study at the first of five habits or disciplines that we are encouraged by the author to practice in our lives so that we can live what he calls and has termed questionable lives. We talked about that last week, what it means to be a Christian living a questionable life inside of a questionable culture. How do we surprise the world with how we live? Today, the, the, the habit we're going to talk about, or the discipline we're going to discuss today and then again in our small groups, or for those of you who have the book, in chapter 3, he discusses this, it's blessing people. We need to be intentional about blessing others. Specifically, he's going to encourage us in the book, and I'm going to encourage you today, for those of you who aren't going to read the book, because I know not all of you are, I'm going to encourage you to do the same thing he encourages us to do in the book. He encourages us to, to bless three people every week. To find three people that we can bless in some way. To be, to be intentional about being a blessing to others. I mean, let me just ask you, how many of you think you can do that? Bless three people? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, I'm going to say 70, 80% of you. That's pretty good. That's better than I expected. I think you can do it too. I think it's totally possible that each and every one of us could bless three people this week if we were intentional about it. Today I want us to look at this familiar passage in Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to look at it in a different way than we usually look at this text. You're going to recognize this text. It's one of the most recognizable, one of the most familiar moments of all of Jesus's ministry. It's when Jesus feeds the 5,000. If you've ever read your Bible, if you've ever been to church, if you've uh, spent any amount of time at all around church people, you've probably heard about this miracle. Amen? Did, did you know that the feeding of the 5,000 is the only one of Jesus' miracles that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. It's the only one of all the miracles, well, outside of the resurrection, that's a miracle. I mean, that's a, that's a big one. But, but it, of the miracles he performed for others here on earth, it's the only one that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. 
You know what that tells me? You know what that tells us? That tells us it's a significant thing. Tells us that's a very, very big deal. That was an important thing for the early church. That was something that stuck out in the minds and the hearts of the apostles decades after Jesus had departed and gone to be with his father. I think the other thing you need to know as we approach this text is that um, this, this happens at the climax of Jesus' ministry. It happens on the outskirts of Galilee. Some of you have been to Galilee. You've traveled there with me to the Holy Land. You've seen the hills that surround the Sea of Galilee where this took place. But unless you've visited, you, you might not understand what a small area Galilee is. In the time of Jesus, Galilee was a, approximately, what was called Galilee, was approximately 50 miles from north to south and approximately 25 miles from east to west at its widest point. Those are the borders of Galilee. To give you an idea of what that looks like, um, Galilee, though it's longer and though it's narrower than Atascosa County, it's not the same shape, Galilee is roughly the same size as Atascosa County in square miles. And that's where the majority of Jesus' ministry took place, was in Galilee. So it's no surprise that Jesus couldn't go anywhere alone, particularly at this point in his ministry. I mean, at this point, at the climax of his ministry, everybody knows who Jesus is. Everybody knows what Jesus can do and has done. I mean, imagine for a moment, just, just imagine if Jesus was here physically with us on earth and had been living in Atascosa County for the last two years and had been doing miracles and preaching and teaching and going into our churches and doing the kinds of things he does in the Gospels, right? Imagine, don't you think everybody in Atascosa County would know about Jesus? Of course they would. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. It's a small area. And see, I want you to understand some of the context here because it, it helps us grasp the significance of the events, the significance of the moment. So what else has happened? John the Baptist has just been killed. He's been martyred for his faith. Jesus makes the decision upon hearing about John the Baptist being killed. He makes the decision to head out up into the hills for a bit. He's trying to to put a little space between himself and everybody else for some obvious reasons. But word gets out, and everybody starts to follow him, and he can't get away. And that's where we pick up in verse 15 of Matthew 14. We're not going to read it from all four of the Gospels, but to get a real full picture of what this looks like and how the day kind of progressed, because each of the Gospels kind of focus on different things, I would encourage you later in your own study time to go read it from all four accounts. But here's what it says in Gospels uh, of Matthew, Matthew's account. It says in verse 15, When evening came, the disciples approached him and said, This place is deserted, and it's already late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. They don't need to go away, Jesus told them. You give them something to eat. But we only have five loaves and two fish here, they said. Bring them here to me, verse 18. Bring them here to me, he said. And then he commanded the crowds to sit down in the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them. He broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and everyone ate and was satisfied. They picked up 12 baskets full of leftover pieces. Now those who ate were about 5,000 men besides the women and the children. Now normally when we read this text and when we preach from this text, when we talk about this text, we focus on the miracle because it's amazing. I mean, Feeding 20, 25,000 people from a sack lunch is pretty cool. Or, or we focus on Jesus. Or we focus on the lack of faith from the disciples. But today I want to focus on the blessing that a little boy was who was just a part of the crowd. 
This little boy gets left out of our focus most of the time. This little boy isn't talked about much. We don't know this little boy's name. We, we, we won't meet him till we get to heaven, presumably. But this little boy was a blessing to 20 or 25,000 people on that day. His life became a blessing to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. See, what I want you to see today is this. You don't have to do big things to bless people in big ways. So many times when it comes to blessing others, what, what I hear, what I, what I sense, what I've seen, is, is people say, well, well, who am I to bless anybody? I, I don't have that much to give. No, nobody would really want a blessing from me anyway. I mean, how, how can I really bless somebody? Listen, you don't have to do big things to bless people in big ways. If you don't believe me, just ask this little boy. The big idea for today is this, if you're writing those down, if you're following along in your bulletin, the big idea is this, a little blessing can go a long way. Just a tiny, itty-bitty, little blessing in somebody's life can go such a long way. But as we, we think about how we can bless the lives of three other people this week, how we can surprise the world, do questionable things, I want you to realize that being a blessing, even in a little way, is going to require us to do three things that are pretty tough. Three tough things that this little boy had to do, but I suspect if he can do it, so can we. Here's the first. If you want to be a blessing... If you want God to use your blessing, you've got to bring it to Jesus. If you want whatever your blessing is to go a long way, you need to bring it to Jesus. One of the things you'll discover if you go and if you read this from all the accounts of the Gospels, you'll discover that Jesus gave the disciples multiple opportunities to trust him with this issue. He gave them multiple opportunities throughout the afternoon, the course of the afternoon, to trust him with the lack of food for these people. But instead, if you go back and read it in all four accounts, you'll notice they didn't do that. They didn't trust Jesus. You know what they did instead? They made excuses. They recounted the facts to Jesus hey, there's no way, I mean, golly, I mean, we, there's not enough money in Galilee to feed all these people, Jesus. They, they, they exclaimed and explained to Jesus how in, expensive it was going to be to feed this group. They even expressed to Jesus that this is impossible. Feeding this many people is just not possible. But the one thing not a single one of the disciples did was bring it to Jesus. You know what? They saw the wrong thing, church. You know what they saw when they, when they looked at all these people? And, and listen, let's not be too hard on them because we probably would have saw it like this too. You know what they saw? They saw what they lacked instead of seeing the sufficiency of Jesus. They saw they didn't have enough, not realizing that Jesus is always enough. Amen. Look at verse 17. But we only have five loaves and two fish here, they said to him. Five loaves and two fish, it's all we got. We don't have enough. We, 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 there's too much lacking here. And then Jesus, he answers the question he's been trying to get them to answer all afternoon. He's given them over and over, time and time again, he's given them the opportunity to answer this. He's been hoping, he's been prodding, he's been pointing them in the right direction all afternoon when you read all the other gospels together. You, you can see Jesus has been pointing them in this direction, but they just, they never got it. And so in verse 18, Jesus answers the question by telling them what to do. And he says this, he says, bring them here to me. In reality, these, this, I mean, this isn't even their bread and fish. They, they act like it's theirs. We only have five loaves and two fish. They didn't even bring the bread and the fish. There was a little boy who brought that. It belonged to the boy. 
In John chapter 6, John's account, it says this in verses 8 through 9, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. (laughs) But again, we see the focus on the lack, right? But what are they for so many people? This is just a sack lunch. How's that going to help? It doesn't even belong to the disciples. It belongs to the boy. They look at it, and all they could see was what was missing. All they could see was what wasn't there. All they could see was what was missing, not what the master could do with what little they had. They needed to change their minds, their perspective, their attitudes. They needed to change. In verse 18, Jesus, he finally breaks the tension that's been going on all afternoon for hours. He gives the disciples the answer. He says, bring it here to me. You know what I've discovered? I've discovered that bringing it to Jesus is many times easier said than done. Whether it's in my life or your life, it's easy to say bring it to Jesus, but it's hard to do it, isn't it? Many times we're just like the disciples, and we don't bring it to Jesus. Many times I'm just like the disciples. I see what's lacking instead of the sufficiency of my Savior. Because I'm focused on so little I have, the little amount of time I have, the little amount of money I have, the the little amount of talent I have, the the little amount of influence I have. I'm focused on, on this little thing that I have And I forget that if I bring it to Jesus, he can do something magnificent with it, no matter how little it is. So many times we don't think we have enough to make a very big difference. But when we bring what little we have to Jesus, we can do so much. Let me give you a couple of examples. Say amen if you've ever had a bad day. Okay. Say amen if you've ever had one of those bad days like that that book. You know the book? The terrible, rotten, horrible, no good, very bad day. Say amen if you've had one of those. Okay. So when I, we've all had those days. When I've had those days, I generally don't feel like being much of a blessing to anybody. I, I generally don't feel like I have much to offer when it comes to blessing anybody. You probably feel that way too when you have one of those days. But even in those days, we have something we can give. Did you know that a a sincere, simple, genuine smile can bless somebody's life? A friendly face can change somebody's day? We, We don't have to spend money to bless people. We don't have to exhaust our last ounce of energy or take hours out of our day to go be a blessing to somebody. Sometimes just a friendly face and a friendly smile is the best part of somebody else's day. A while back, I had one of those days. It was, it was a long day. I'd worked all day. I went to San Antonio to catch a flight to Indianapolis. It was supposed to be a simple little deal. San Antonio to Dallas, Dallas to Indianapolis. Got to San Antonio, we got delayed. That meant I was gonna miss my flight in Dallas to get to Indianapolis, which meant I was gonna miss the breakfast, the men's breakfast I was speaking at the next morning at 6 a.m. because there were no other flights out of Dallas that evening. And I told the the little girl at the counter, I said, listen, I gotta get to Indianapolis. And she said, well, we can get you there. You just gotta fly to Houston and then South Carolina And then from South Carolina, you can get to Indianapolis. And I said, well, what time will that get me in? She said, about 12 o'clock. I said, okay, that's fine. Let's do it. Put me on the flights. I got to get there. So I got to Houston. I went from Houston after a little delay to South Carolina. I got to South Carolina, and our plane was broke. (laughs) And they said, you know what? You're going to have to spend the night in South Carolina because there's there's no other plane we can take at this point, and I thought, Lord, this can't be. I mean, I, who am I going to call? It's, it's already like 9.30 at night, 10 o'clock at night at this point. Who am I going to call to tell them I'm not going to be at the breakfast in the morning? Lord, this can't be. And, and about the time we were all getting up to go figure out what we were doing for the night, they came back on and they said, hold on, there might be a crew in a plane. Y'all just wait another minute or two. So a minute or two turned into about two hours. And they put us on a plane, 
and we, we got to Indianapolis. Now, the whole time I'd been busy, I was working on the flights, I was emailing people, I was finishing up a sermon for the next Sunday, I was preparing and finalizing kind of my thoughts for the, the speaking engagement the next morning, and due to all of those delays and everything else, we get into Indianapolis about 2.30 in the morning, just a couple of hours before 6 a.m. when I'm supposed to speak. I had been up since 5.30 the morning before, I was tired. I was worn out. I mean, it had been one of those days. And so I'm shuffling out the plane with my suitcase. And I got my head down. And I'm just done with this day. And as I approached the pilot up in the front of the plane, he said, hey, man. And I looked up because I figured he was talking to me. And he gave me a big old smile. Like a big smile. I could see his teeth and everything. And he said, hey, man, we made it. (laughs) And then he said, and I didn't kill us on the way. (laughs) And he chuckled and laughed. And I chuckled and laughed. And you know what? His humor and his smile just instantly blessed me. It changed my entire day. It didn't cost him anything. And it reminded me of how that one small thing can make a difference in somebody's life. I love what Max Lucado once said. He said, what we carry is small, but in the hands of Jesus, it becomes enough. I want you to go out this week and take that small thing you have, give it to Jesus, bring it to Jesus, and it will be enough. I want you to bless the lives of three people this week. If you really want your blessing to count, then you've got to bring it to Jesus first. When we put something little and tiny like a sack lunch in the hands of Jesus, it goes a long way, amen? And it can be hard to give what little we have at the end of a hard day. It can be hard to give what little we have to Jesus and trust him with it. But we've got to stop thinking about what we lack and giving what we have. A little blessing goes a long way. Now here's the second thing. And this one's even harder than the first. (laughs) We have to let Jesus take whatever we bring him, and we have to allow him, if he chooses, we have to allow him to break it. It's never fun to watch something special be broken, is it? Or to see some great treasure be broken into a bunch of pieces? I'm going to show you a picture. Do you guys know what this is? Let's put the first picture up here. Do y'all know what that is? It's an airplane. That's right. You're, you're, technically, you're right. It's not the answer I'm going for, but it's a, it is an airplane. Um, we have a little bit of a closer shot. Maybe I can put that up here for you guys. Still looks like an airplane, a rotting airplane. We're getting closer. You know what this is? This, this is not just an airplane. This is Elvis Presley's private jet. Now, I've known about this private jet. Y'all, y'all know me. I love to fly. Been, been in aviation since I was a kid. Had my pilot's license. Love to fly. I've known about this jet for over 30 years. And for all those years, for decades, it's been sitting outside on the ramp, just like that, rotting away all this time. It's been for sale on and off. Different brokerages has had it. They've had it up for different prices. And there was a time, I'm going to say seven or eight years ago, that it was up for sale and they wanted $40,000 for it. 40,000 bucks. And I thought about buying it. I mean, seriously considered it. I wanted to buy it. I thought, man, $40,000. I know $40,000 is a lot of money, but it's not that much money for a jet (laughs) that Elvis Presley flew. I I, I mean, I can remember sitting in bed dreaming about this jet (laughs) and what it would look like if I repainted it and how much would it cost me to get it flying again and how cool would it be if I had Elvis Presley's jet? (laughs) And and the inside of it, I know the outside looks bad, but y'all, the inside was still really nice. I got some pictures of it for you. This is his bedroom. They had covered it. Look at that old TV in the back of his jet. I thought, how cool would that be? The back of my jet would have an old TV in it. This would be great. 
Here's some, some pictures of the seats. I mean, it, it looks great. This would be an awesome jet. Now, as you can probably guess, I never bought it. <laughs> and do you want to know why I didn't buy it? The only reason I didn't buy it is because I couldn't ever figure out what I would do with it. I couldn't figure out how I was going to make enough money to get it flying again, or if it ever could fly again, or what I would do with it. I mean, it would probably just end up sitting out here at our airport, rotting away, just like it was there. I I couldn't figure it out. It wasn't practical. It just didn't make any sense to buy it. And I wasn't the only one. Over the course of these decades, hundreds of thousands of other people just like me had had the same thoughts about this jet. This thing was not a secret. It was everywhere. Anybody who knows airplanes or, or follows airplane magazines or anybody who follows aviation at all knew about this plane. It was not a secret. Well, not long ago, a guy bought it. Finally, after all these years, he has a YouTube channel. Imagine that. And what he does is he takes old airplanes and he fixes them up. He finds these old, impossible airplanes and he fixes them on his YouTube channel. But he couldn't even fix Elvis's plane. He had an entirely different idea for it. He had an entirely different vision for it, and it's brilliant. You know what he did? He broke it. He broke the wings off of it, took the wings off of it. And after he got the wings off of it, he redid the fuselage, and he mounted it up on an RV chassis. The fuselage, the middle part of it. And he made it into an RV. And they actually drive it down the road. Look at the mirrors. You see the mirrors on it? They drive it down the road from the yoke up in the cockpit. You sit in the cockpit and you drive it like a car. It's the most brilliant thing ever. And he drives it to air shows and he charges people $10 a piece to go inside of it. And that's what it looks like now. He also took the wings off of it, like I told you, because you can't drive it down the road with the wings. Obviously, this wouldn't work. He took the wings off of it. You know what he did? He broke the wings up into thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces, and he's selling them. He's made them into these little oval tags, and he's selling them with a certificate of authenticity and a copy of the bill of sale from when Elvis bought the plane. So... For the, a small sum of money, a couple hundred bucks, you can own a piece of Elvis's private jet. Brilliant. <laughs> this guy is making money hand and fist with this thing. You see, here's, here was my problem, and the problem of everybody else. We couldn't figure out how to do anything with it because I didn't want to break it. It never even crossed my mind to break it. All I wanted to do was put it back together. All I wanted to do was paint it and fix it and fly it. All I could think about was, how do I get it flying again? And then this guy comes along and says, forget that. I'm going to break it into a bunch of pieces. I'm going to make a museum out of it, drive it around the country so it can bless people and bless me $10 at a time. (laughs) And I'm going to break the wings up into thousands of little pieces and send it out to all these people who love Elvis, who would love to have a piece of his airplane, and that'll be a blessing to them, and be a blessing to me too. (laughs) You see, here's what I'm trying to say. If we want what little we have to be a blessing, we're probably gonna have to let Jesus break it. Look at verse 19. Then he commanded the crowds to sit down in the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish, the sack lunch, and looking up to heaven, He blessed them, and then what did he do? He broke the loaves. He broke it. He took that little sack lunch, and he started breaking it up into pieces. I wonder if anyone there thought, how many of y'all think somebody there probably thought, what's he he doing? Now, this isn't going to help anybody. There already wasn't very much, and now he's breaking it up into even smaller portions. I wonder if even the boy who brought it thought, man, there goes my dinner. (laughs) He's breaking it apart. See, Jesus modeled this with his own life and death even. Say amen if you've ever been blessed by Jesus. If Jesus' life has blessed your life. Amen? 
Now think about what he told the disciples. John 12, 23 through 24. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. What he was reminding them is that in order for a single grain of wheat to become a blessing and produce fruit for more, it has to die. It has to go into the ground, be buried. It has to break open, be split. And then and only then will it rise up and be a blessing and produce the fruit. He was saying that of his own life. He said, I'm going to have to be broken to bless all of us who just said amen. Jesus has blessed my life. So as we consider how our lives are going to bless other people's lives, I, I want you to know that Jesus might just take what little thing you have. He might just take whatever you bring to him. He might just take whatever you lay on the table. He might just take whatever you offer up and he might break it. He might do something with it you didn't expect. He might do something with it you never thought of. And that's okay. Because he's Jesus. And you know what, church? In my experience, brokenness often comes before the breakthrough. Letting God do whatever he wants with whatever you bring means you have to be willing to let him to break it if he wants to. And a little blessing that you'll bring to Jesus and say, Lord, if you want to break it, you can break it. I'm telling you, a little blessing like that can go a long way in the life of somebody. So if we want to be a blessing, we've got to bring it to Jesus, whatever we've got. We've got to be willing to allow him to break it. And then here's the third and the final one. We have to bestow it. We have to give it away. We have to spread it out. We have to put it on the table. We have to let Jesus use it however he wants to use it in whatever way he wants to use it. Look at verse 19. Look at what Jesus did next in Matthew 14, 19. Then he commanded the crowds to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed them. He broke the loaves. He gave them to the disciples and then the disciples gave them to the crowds. Now keep in mind, nobody gets to eat. I mean, this never ever happens. If the boy didn't bring it, if Jesus didn't break it, and then if the disciples didn't bestow it to the crowd. There's a process here. All of this falls in place for this blessing to occur. The boy brings it, Jesus breaks it and blesses it, and then the disciples are the ones who distribute it and bestow it. Now, there are a thousand little ways you can bless somebody this week. But it's never going to happen if you don't do it. You can think about it. You can pray about it. You can write it in your fancy journal. But if you don't go out and do it, it's not going to happen. If you don't make up your mind to be a generous person and to live a generous life and to say, you know what, I can be a blessing to three people this week. I know I can. It's not going to happen. So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to share that joke. Maybe not that joke, but a good joke. I want to encourage you to share your smile. I want to encourage you to make the call. I want to encourage you to write the letter. I want to encourage you to buy somebody lunch if the Lord leads you to do it. I want to encourage you to take a minute and go next door and knock on your neighbor's door and visit with them. I want to encourage you to stop by the nursing home on your way home from work. I know you, it's been a busy and long day and you've got things to do, but stop in for 15 or 20 minutes and be a blessing. I want to encourage you when you're going through the line at the grocery store to grab the gift card, even if you don't know who God's going to tell you to give it to yet. I want to encourage you to type the email and hit send. I want to encourage you to offer the forgiveness they haven't earned yet. Whatever it is, do it. 
Because if you don't do it, it's not going to make any difference at all. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul's talking about the matter of giving financially. But this principle of, of generosity, this principle of financial giving applies to all acts of giving, all acts of generosity, all acts of sharing, even the act of sharing or being generous with the blessing. Look at what it says. He says, the point is this, verse 6, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Church, if we don't make it a point to sow blessings, how will anyone ever receive them? You don't have to do a lot to make a big difference. Just consider the kid who had a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. And remember that a little blessing can go a really, really long way. If you want to surprise the world this week, it's not that hard. Go out and bless three people. No matter what that blessing is, no matter how big or small it is, bless three people. Even if it seems extremely small, bring it to Jesus, let him break it, you bestow it, and just watch what happens. You know what is interesting? If we all went out and blessed three people this week, we would bless over 5,000 people this week. Amen. How cool would that be, church? How cool would it be if Cowboy Fellowship blessed over 5,000 people this week? Bring it, let him break it, and bestow it. And never forget that we serve a God who is known for using little things to make a big difference. One commentator noted it like this. He said, God used a baby's cry to move the heart of Pharaoh's daughter and a shepherd's crook to work miracles in Egypt. He used a boy with a slingshot to slay Goliath and rout the Philistine army. He used a poverty-stricken widow to sustain Elijah and a young girl to lead the leprous Naaman to Elisha. He used Balaam's donkey to teach his truth and the jawbone of another donkey to slay a thousand men. He used a little child to teach his disciples humility and he used one boy's lunch to feed 25,000 people. Church, I believe God wants to use you. I believe God wants to surprise the world through you. And just a little blessing from you can go a long way this week. Before we close, we cannot miss the message of the gospel in all of this. As always, Christ is the example. He is the model, and he is at the center of everything in this church and our lives. So I want to take about 65 seconds here and remind you this. God brought Jesus to earth to live a sinless life for all humanity, for you, for me, for every single one of us. He brought him here. He sent him here. And then after living this sinless life and three years of ministry, he went to the cross. And there on the cross, God broke him. The Bible says he literally crushed him. To the point that Jesus cried out, why have you forsaken me? And then God raised him from the dead and bestowed his grace and his life and his blood on every single one of us, making his life become the ultimate blessing for anyone who will repent, believe, and confess that Jesus is Lord. What a blessing. I pray you don't leave this place today with your mind set so much on being a blessing that you miss the blessing that Jesus is for your own life. If you've never called on him as your Lord and Savior, I pray you would do that today. Repent, believe, confess, and be blessed by the blood that forgives, by the only one who can take away your sins, by the only one who can write your name in the Lamb's book of life. Be blessed this day by the one who died for you. Let's pray. If that's you and you've never called on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that before we close. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm just going to ask you to pray with me in the stillness of your heart. 
Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up, gone astray. And so today I repent of my sins. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me, that you would make me new, that you would cleanse me. Lord, I ask that you would change me in the most radical and eternal way possible. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and for your mercy, for your forgiveness and for the hope that is the gospel. Father, as we close this hour, Lord, I pray. I pray that every single one of us would be ready to be a blessing this week, this day, perhaps even this hour or before we get off this campus. Father, I pray that we would be about your business that we would not be so short-sighted or hard-headed as the disciples, not to bring whatever little thing we have to you and to focus on our lack instead of your sufficiency. Lord, that we would not be so stingy with what we have as to say you can't break this if you want to. And Lord, that we would not be so busy that we wouldn't have time to bestow a little blessing on somebody else. Help us, Lord. Help us to surprise the world by showing them who you are through the blessings they will receive. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us here on YouTube or social media uh, for this message. We pray that God uses it to bless your life. If you don't mind, hit the subscribe, the follow, the like, the thumbs up button. Uh, Leave an encouraging comment down below. It's so encouraging for us to hear how this is impacting you wherever you may be. And if you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray for you with that as well. You can submit those by going to our website, cowboyfellowship.org. We pray that this blesses you. Thanks for being a part of our online family.